shall we do the confessions? I believe in the Almighty God, our Father and Creator. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God and my Savior. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. He suffered, died and rose again. He ascended into heaven. He shall soon come again. I believe in God the Holy Spirit who is worshipped and my guide. I believe in holy fellowship, faithful giving and service to God in this church. I believe the Holy Bible is the perfect word of God. I am what it says I have. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today as I learn the word of God here in my spiritual family, I am blessed, healed and anointed for a holy and victorious living. I will never again be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless us. Please be seated. Last week was one of the most active weeks in this church with all of the kids that came in. In the morning, it was the kids. And in the afternoon, it was the bigger kids, the teenagers. Take a look at what was happening. Thank you volunteers for making it happen. I think when kids come, you know, yeah, go ahead, sure. When, when kids come, I think all parents also in some way become volunteers because kids can't come on their own, but thank you so much. It's so beautiful to see how the future of the church is already active in the church. Amen. Absolutely. Thank you, Pastor Deepak, and thank you all the uh, Kids Church and Teens Church directors. Uh, really fantastic uh, to see what God is doing through your life. Uh, every year it keeps growing larger, getting better. It's been happening from the last 15, 20 years, and we thank God for that good trajectory of ministry in the church. We've been studying this month on the Holy Spirit of God. I have to tell you, it's few topics uh, get a lot of response. And this was one of the topics that I, I thought had a lot of response uh, with people saying, thank you for teaching on the Holy Spirit. And uh, I don't go by uh, what is more popular topic. I usually pray and prepare every year uh, sometime in the second half, usually around September, October, take a few days to spend time in prayer, sometimes in fasting, seeking God, asking God for what I should preach next year. And uh, according to the timeline God puts in my heart, I just note down the titles and prepare uh, messages uh, almost a year in advance and start working on it. So, uh, but it's interesting that many topics suddenly become popular and I'm so happy with the kind of response I got from uh, this topic on the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that shows that the church is so healthy and vibrant, right? It just shows that people are focused in the right direction. People are interested in knowing more about how to relate with the Holy Spirit. And last Sunday, we studied about the person of the Holy Spirit. And today we want to look at the presence of the Holy Spirit. And next Sunday, we might look at the performance of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that we must not put our attention so much on the power of the Holy Spirit, and we must move more into focusing on the presence of the Holy Spirit, because it's the presence of the Holy Spirit that manifests the person of the Holy Spirit. Many believers, they don't deny the presence of the Holy Spirit. They know God said, I'll be with you. So they know Holy Spirit is with me. Though they don't deny the presence of the Holy Spirit, they don't rely on the Holy Spirit. It's like you have a mobile phone, but it's switched off. 
It's like you have the Holy Spirit with you, but you ignore him. When you don't rely on the Holy Spirit, even though you don't deny the Holy Spirit, it's almost as if he is not there. It's very important to understand the importance of relying on the Holy Spirit. But pastor, you don't understand. I'm a real estate agent. Why should I rely on the Holy Spirit? Hey, friendship with the Holy Spirit, lordship of the Holy Spirit is not contextual, is not subject to your profession. Everybody can have a good relationship with the Holy Spirit. Everybody of any profession. But pastor, I'm a salesman. You know, the other day someone told me, Pastor, I'm in the music industry and, and can God use me? And I said, I think God can use you more in the music industry. The other day a lady from Mumbai said, I'm a model in Mumbai. Do you think that God really cares for me? Do you think I can be of any use for God? And I told her this. I said, I think you can be more useful for God than me as a pastor because I am more with Christian people almost in the light but you are so much in the dark, even a little light in you is going to shine bright for the glory of God. It doesn't matter where you are, you can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit of God and His presence can have an impact on your life. Amen. That is the reality. But pastor, I'm just a driver. I mean, what do I do with the Holy Spirit in my life? You will never know how the Holy Spirit works. So there's this interesting story of a lady from Singapore. If you're watching me, God bless you. So I, I got to hear the story after the COVID season. So during the COVID season, our online uh, attendance just peaked suddenly. And, and that's another interesting thing, you know. Uh, sometimes God doesn't, uh, sometimes God works through people in the church. And uh, in 2017, 18, 19, young people in the church, especially in the media team, kept irritating me saying, we have to have online presence. We must be on the social media. We must have all the kind of equipments that the church needs to go online. And honestly, I was getting disturbed by these guys. I, I like the idea of putting the gospel out there. I mean, that's beautiful. I believe in uh, preaching the gospel in the television and the media, but... But this was getting a little too much because, you know, there's a budget attached to every expansion and, and I was not too sure. And so, but they kept, uh, you know, telling, let's do it. So they kept building things up and over a period of time, you know, everything that was required for an online uh, activity was already there. And suddenly in 2020, March, I think it was, uh, the prime minister announced the surprise lockdown, right? And nobody could move. And all of a sudden, church couldn't happen here. All over India, all over the world actually. Uh, everything got locked out. And that's when I realized how God used the media fellows to keep bothering me and getting the online stuff fixed, you know. All of a sudden, <laughs> sometimes God will use media people as your prophet. And, and it's interesting. Just plug and play. All of a sudden, we were available literally to tens of thousands of people on a daily basis and millions of people on a weekly basis or monthly. It's just crazy how suddenly it became a big ministry. Now, here's the thing. There was a lady in Singapore and, and she sent an email and she sent a big offering to the church. And so I'm telling you this story. So she says, I'm a Chinese uh, Singaporean and... Uh, I, I came across your online ministry and uh, I used to watch it on the YouTube. And my driver is a Malaysian Muslim and he had no choice. He has to listen because I am the owner of the car. He's my driver. And when I'm going to work, I'm listening to your messages in the church on a daily basis. Well, so she said, well, as a result of listening to your messages every day, week after week, month after month, my Malaysian Muslim driver has become a believer, a Christian. Now listen, it gets better. And now the man is leaving the job or something like that, and he is committed to going and preaching Jesus in his community wherever he gets an opportunity. Oh, go ahead, give God a big hand. I want to tell you, 
When you fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you never know how God begins to work through your life. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. It is important. And God begins to use you in a powerful way. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and when you fellowship with the Holy Spirit, don't tell the Holy Spirit what to do. You ask the Holy Spirit, what should I do? This is one problem. Sometimes we get so full of faith, we tell God what to do. No. Our faith should be so that we can obey God, not dictate to God. Our faith should be worshipful faith, not dictatorial faith. Faith that tells God what to do is also called rebellion. But faith that worships him, saying, God, you tell me what to do, leads to honor and obedience of God. This is really what happened with the Lord Jesus too. You know, the multitudes that followed Jesus, when they saw his power to heal people, when they saw he could raise people from the dead, they noticed in a short notice, he could take entire villages to follow him. All of them ganged up together and they started searching for Jesus. Why? We want to make him king. He should become our king. He is the only one who can unify all the 12 tribes of Israel, get the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the two high priests, which is against the law of God, everyone to come together. Only he can do that and we can throw the Roman Empire out of Israel. The Bible says Jesus went away from them, went into hiding because Jesus did not come to become a political king. He came as a spiritual king. And we must understand, whenever we start forcing the Holy Spirit, Lord, you are powerful. Change your heart to marry me. Touch that man, Lord. Oh, let me take him. Oh, Father, let him take me with him, oh God. Oh, touch that lady, oh God. When you start making prayers, which are probably your greed, which are probably your desire, and sometimes against the will of God, Holy Spirit might become inactive. He might become quiet because he doesn't come to fulfill our purpose. He comes to fulfill his greater purpose. Why? His ways are greater than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. My plans are not your plans. Oh, come on, give God a big hand. Oh, hallelujah. <coughs> Whenever we have such selfish agenda of human wisdom or lust, it usually ruins our harmony with the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. That's why Galatians chapter 5, I like the message version. Let's read together. My counsel is this, live freely, animated and motivated by God's Spirit, then you won't feed the compulsions of personal selfishness. Be animated, be motivated, be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Then you will not be forced or bogged down into taking your own wrong, selfish, lustful thoughts as priority. And when you read that passage, it talks about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. It's very interesting. Thank you. Works of the flesh and fruit of the spirit are two things that are given there. Works of the flesh and fruit of the spirit. It's very interesting. To approach towards character formation, work of the flesh and fruit of the spirit. There are two ways your character can be formed. One is through the work of the flesh and the other is through the fruit of the spirit. And this is where we understand the gospel of Jesus is not character behavior modification, but a heart transformation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The fruit of the Holy Spirit in my life doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. I'll say that again. English is a tricky language. The fruit of the Spirit working in me doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. Johnson gets better than Johnson when the Holy Spirit works in Johnson. And that appears, appears for you also. <laughs> Don't compare yourself with another. Compare yourself with your yesterday. 
You become better version of yourself when the Holy Spirit is working in you. Ah. Hallelujah. You see, we are, God never told us to change our character. Ah, this is tight one. God may have told us uh, to change our character. But if you really look at the progression of it, God says, you build your relationship with the Holy Spirit and he will build your character. Amen. That's why it's not called work of the flesh. It's called fruit of the spirit. Uh -huh. If building love, faith, joy, character, patience, long-suffering, self-temperance, self-control, if all of that was my work, it would be called work of faith, but it's called fruit of the spirit. It's not called work of the flesh against the work of the spirit. It's called work of the flesh against the fruit of the spirit. Mm. Allow the Holy Spirit to develop that fruitfulness in our life. Our job is to cultivate intimacy with the Holy Spirit and it's his job and he is faithful to build character in our lives. Christian character cannot be developed through striving and struggling. It is developed through surrender to the Holy Spirit. Because Holy Spirit is not like Pastor Johnson. One big difference between Pastor Johnson and the Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit whispers. Pastor Johnson shouts and turns up the volume at the back. Holy Spirit whispers. You can hear Pastor Johnson even if you're sitting in the car waiting for your husband to come. But you can hear the Holy Spirit only if you listen carefully and are in deep fellowship because he whispers. He doesn't shout. A very important principle to learn. Holy Spirit whispers and therefore intimate relationship is important to hear him. Fruit of the Holy Spirit develops in us not as actions but as attitudes. Attitudes are the fundamental reality of who you are, the, the real you inside, not just your actions. Attitude is really what makes you react the way you react to the world outside you. In fact, really when you look at life, <laughs> You are more of how you react to your circumstance than really what your circumstance does to you. How you react does more to you than what your circumstance does to you. What that person spoke to you doesn't actually hurt you compared to the way you behave back to that person and what behavior does to you is more dangerous than what that person does to you. How you react based on your attitude actually determines where you go in life. And that's why when you look at the Bible, healings, miracles, salvation, the minute you say, Lord Jesus, I welcome you in my life, immediately you become a child of God. Holy Spirit comes in you. But sanctification, cleansing, <laughs> becoming fruitful is a process that takes time of maturity. Some of us are praying, God, give me a character of peace. God, give me patience in my life, Lord. Give me courage in my life, Lord. And we are waiting for that birthday gift to come. No, it doesn't come like that. It doesn't come as a birthday gift. Many times, God puts us in a situation where the seed of that character God has put in us can evolve. Where that seed of patience, where that seed of concentration can evolve in our life. God puts that seed in us and waits for it to germinate. You're praying for courage and what do you get? A very frightening situation. Pastor, I prayed for courage. Then why God is putting me in scary situation? So that the seed of courage in you can germinate. It can grow. Aha. Uh -huh. Pastor, I was praying for patience. Then why is God putting me in such an impatient situation? So that the seed of patience can grow in your life. Yes, a lot of times when we pray for something, God doesn't gift you the fruit. Have you ever seen an apple tree 
praying, God, give me fruit. And even if you see that God will not pluck fruit from somewhere and fix it on the tree. No, God will give it enough summer. God will give it enough winter. God will give it enough difficulty for the roots to grow. And God will provide just sufficient nutrients and water for the roots to absorb. God will give the tree sufficiency of circumstance to produce the fruit from within. God will not go to the market and buy some apple fruit and fix it on this. No. God is not going to bring patience from outside and put it on you. No. He will put you in a circumstances of opportunity where your courage is going to grow. Where your patience is going to grow. Where, ah, give, 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 give. God a big hand. I tell you, this is so powerful. This is so powerful. When God puts you in a circumstance, it is not to destroy you. It is not to break you. It is to build you because he will never put you in a circumstance and walk away. He will put you there and he'll come with you and build you in the process. <coughs> Intimacy with the Holy Spirit will make you fruitful and you're surprised. Man, I never knew this was in me. <laughs> it's not the work of your flesh. It's the fruit of the spirit in you. Hallelujah. It can happen in the boardroom of your corporate office. It can happen in the canteen of your college. It can happen in the playground with your neighboring parents watching their children around you. It can happen in any circumstance. We must learn to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His presence produces fruitfulness. <laughs> I like this scripture so much. Shall we read it together? Matthew chapter 4 verse 19. And Jesus said to them, Come after me as disciples, letting me be your... Follow me. Ah, follow me and I will make you... Full stop. Fishers of men is because they were fishers of fisher. Peter and all were fishing company. And God said, hereafter you will not catch fish, you will catch people. But who will make you? Not local Bible college. Who will make you? Not some special ministry. I, interaction with my Holy Spirit, my presence working on you, I will make you. Lift your hands and say, God, you make me. You create in me. You make me what you want me to be. Please put your hands down. God says, I'll make you. <laughs> you know, I had this very beautiful experience. Uh, you know, there are rare times where God has spoken to me very clearly and I cannot forget those impressions of the Holy Spirit. One of the times when I, I was in Kashmir for whatever. Um, so while we were landing in Srinagar, the pilot announced, ladies and gentlemen, if you will turn to the right hand side, and just look over through the window. You see the mountain capped, the snow capped mountains of Kashmir. And I thought, yeah, let's see. And I looked over. It was beautiful. It was breath. There's no place on the earth like Kashmir. It's so, that day, it was so beautiful. It was so lovely. The sun shining on that beautiful mountain tops gave a feeling of a silver lining all over the landscape with those beautiful greeneries around, which was also slightly snow capped. It was just beautiful. It was incredible. I was just trying to absorb, you know, no cameras can catch those moments. Those are ecstasy moments. I was just absorbing it and I felt the Holy Spirit saying, you like it? I said, yes, Lord, it's beautiful. And I felt the Lord asking me, do you know why it's beautiful? I don't know what I answered. Something like, you created it, so it's beautiful. Something, some, you know, smart answer. <laughs> but I felt the Holy Spirit saying, it's beautiful because those mountains and those sceneries, they never run away in different seasons. They stay there. They stay there through the seasons. And that's why they are so beautiful. And I felt the Holy Spirit saying, when I take you through different seasons, if you stay faithful, I can make your life more beautiful than that. You know, 
that day in the aircraft looking out of the window i got a personal message from the lord that i cannot forget for a lifetime you stay faithful through the seasons and i can make your life more beautiful if we can stay faithful in our relationship with god god can make our life more beautiful follow me be in touch with me let me be your guide let me help you pick right emotions to respond and i will make you and when god makes you oh the beauty of his work even the world painters and photographers cannot capture the greatness of his scenery is so marvelous you know people can be so excited about buildings i myself am excited about buildings we we are so excited about good cities and all of that but when you really want a break you will go to something god created whether it's a mountain side or a beach side or it is a river side or it is a desert side something god created you can never get bored with that you can never get tired with that you can never get disillusioned with that whatever beautiful building another architect will come and do another better one whatever beautiful model another phone will come with a better model but what god has created is so perfect allah have got to make you I love God to make you. I will make you. Hallelujah. It's a promise this morning God is giving to some of you. God is saying, I will make you. It looks like the devil is going to break you, but God says, no, 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 no. My hands are on you. I will make you. <coughs> Amen. Hallelujah. If, if you get excited about how God is using somebody, don't copy what they do. you will become a failure you saw a judge making a verdict in the court now you go home and act like a judge don't copy what they do it won't give you results you saw an engineer design something beautiful and now you pull up a table and you put up some charts please you you can't become an engineer by copying an engineer You saw that doctor and the way you saw it on the YouTube how he cut the heart open and you got excited please don't <laughs> copy the doctor <laughs> don't copy the pastor <laughs> copy the process what did the engineer do to become that how many hours did he study what did he study go through the process What did that doctor do? What did the judge do? Copy the process. Don't imitate the result. Go into the secret life. The unseen life. Study that many hours. Get that discipline. And then you will see how God makes you something great. Don't copy the results. One big mistake many people make. and i i advise some young people who want to do ministry and and they are like we want to serve god like you are serving god and i tell them fellows you are coming at the after the intermission you know half of the movie is over and you are coming now you should have watched the days in the beginning nobody was there that time today no but you grew overnight yeah night was 25 years long <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times people just want to copy the results listen brothers and sisters copy the character learn the process it is about relationship with the holy spirit hallelujah and that is where you begin to have godly results for your life the bible says in chapter 4 of matthew's gospel the chapter that we read the bible says and jesus was filled with the holy spirit and led by the spirit let's say that together filled by the spirit and led by the spirit listen to the chronology i don't mean politics listen to the progression being filled with the spirit then being led by the spirit we want to pay the prophet an offering so that we can be led by the spirit without the process of discipline of being filled by the spirit 
We want the pastor to lay his hands on our head and prophesy so we can be led by the spirit without paying the price of cultivating a relationship of being filled by the spirit. Jesus was filled by the spirit and then led by the spirit. And I think that's normal. When people are filled with anger, it's not common sense that leads them. It's anger that leads them. When people are filled with lust and sexual perversion, they are not led with love or wisdom. They are led with that passion of negativity. When people are filled with hatred, they are not voting for love. It's natural. Whatever you're filled with will lead you. That's why the Bible says be filled with the spirit. You want the Lord to lead you, be filled with his lordship. Last Sunday I preached about zigzag. Did you all like it? Zigzag. It's okay, you don't even remember. I understand. Last Sunday I preached about zigzag. Zigzag is a place. David as a nomad in the back in the days when he didn't have a throne God had promised him anointed him but still hadn't given him the promise he was in the process of being trained into fulfilling God's plan for his life he had developed a 400 to 600 men as a militia for guerrilla warfare they were those street fighters but they were victorious King Saul back in Israel was against David. And so he had to run away from Israel because he didn't want to fight his own people. So he was out of Israel, out of the territory of Israel because he didn't want Saul to catch him. King Saul shouldn't catch me. One of those days he was jobless and he told his 400, 600 men, guys, let's leave our wives and kids here. Let's leave our families, our stuff here from Ziklag. Let's go two, three days to another king. So they walked up to another king and two or three days away and said, oh, king, use us. You know, we are, we are a military. I mean, we are powerful. We are a guerrilla warfare team. We are militia. We are well trained. The king heard it all and said, no, I don't want you. Go. Now they're coming back dejected, rejected, suppressed, oppressed, depressed. And when they come back to Ziglag, nothing is there. Some other group came and stolen all their wives and children and uh, all their materials and gone. Nothing is there. The people who were with David got angry at David. Even the finest leaders sometimes face rebellion. Because they were so exasperated. They took stones to throw at David. Who taught them stone throwing? David. <laughs> they all picked up stones to throw at David. The Bible says David was greatly distressed. But the next line says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David went to God's presence. Now he can hear people saying, you start da, you throw da. You know, first you throw da, we'll throw later da. Okay, go close and throw da. David can hear that. But David decided to cut out those voices. <laughs> Cutting out noise was not the technology Apple invented. It started with a God-fearing man called David. He cut out those noises and he said, God, I sit at your feet. I don't know what to do, but one thing I know, I don't want my heart to be distressed. I want to trust you. I want to believe you. I want my joy back from you. I want my happiness back from you. Before I can get my wife back, I want my joy back. What a statement was that? <laughs> Before I get my wife back, I want my joy back. Hallelujah. It's not in the Bible, but I guess that's how it was. <laughs> Before I get my happiness back from things around me, I want my happiness back from you, O oh God. He found a strength in God. Before these guys can support me, I want your support, O oh God. After he had strengthened himself in the Lord is God, then he asked God, God, tell me what to do. And God told him how to fight. 
Why did God tell him how to fight? Because his strength came from God. God will never give you a plan if God feels you're going to fight it in your strength. God will give you a plan when God knows you will fight it in God's strength. And of course, he went and motivated all the 400, 600 fair weather friends and they all turned around, fought the war and got back all their wives and children and everything and they were very happy. They forgot about, they wanted to throw stones at David. They forgot that. Contrast that with King Saul. First Samuel chapter 28, the Bible says, and when Saul, King Saul saw the vast armies of the Philistines, he got scared. He got scared. This is more than looking at your 10th standard exam paper. This is warfare. He got scared. The Bible says he was greatly distressed and terribly scared. And what did Saul do? He ran to God's presence. God, talk to me. What should I do? The Bible says God did not answer him. Oof, tough scripture. One of the very difficult scriptures. Why? Because Saul was not bothered about finding strength from God. God only wanted a prophetic future prediction. Saul only wanted prophetic future prediction. Didn't want any relationship with God. Didn't want strength from God. Not Just tell me what will be the future. God said, I'm not your local astrologer to tell you your future. God kept quiet. God talked. Mm -mm. Finally, the guy goes to a witch, a female soothsayer filled with demon spirits. Talk to me. She says, in this battle, you will die. At least now, go find your strength in God. No. God will not guide you until you learn to relate with God and find your strength from God. <laughs> Whom should I marry, pastor? First, find your strength and peace in God. Otherwise, whomever you marry, peace will not come. <laughs> That's why First Samuel chapter 15, God had told King Saul, do you think all God wants are sacrifices? Empty rituals just for show? He wants you to listen to him. Plain listening is the thing. Not staging a lavish religious production. I like the message version on this. God is saying, King James Version, it's better to listen than to offer sacrifice. Same thing in local language. God is not interested in your production of religiosity. God is interested in that relationship where you will just listen. Just listen. Just listen. I'm going to ask you a question. When was the last time you tried to hear God? Let it be a daily thing. Listen to his presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You all remember that portion, no? First Samuel chapter 15. It is better to obey than to sacrifice. Same thing we read. Read that again, please. Put it up again. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. This is the message version, okay? It's a, it's a local language. Then Samuel said, do you think all God wants are sacrifices? Empty rituals just for the show? No, no, no. He wants you to listen to him. Plain listening is the thing. Not staging a... Lavish, religious production. God is not interested in all these things. God is more interested in your obedience. Obedience comes from honor. Honoring God is different from obeying God. Obedience is the action part of it. Honoring God is the attitude part of it. Attitude of honoring God. Let me give you an example. Some people have difficulty in honoring God. Why should I honor this pastor, huh? Why should I honor this uh, uh, Bible verse like he's teaching? Huh? Why should I honor my prayer group uh, coach? Huh? I'll give you one thing. Da. The Lord Jesus Christ is the son of God. Nobody can get better than that. <laughs> Did he ever tell Mary and Joseph, what you people can teach me? Have you ever preached? Do you know at least how to run a synagogue? Have you ever healed anybody? 
do you know what mission i have come with don't tell me what to do i have appointed you as parents nothing the bible says luke chapter 2 and jesus grew up in subjection to his parents learn one thing brothers and sisters when you and i are filled with the holy spirit there will be an attitude of honor in our lives amen hey i think i'm preaching really good last sunday and today no it's coming out beautiful sister you clap your hands you have to honor your husband <laughs> and don't honor that man that is not your husband culture of honor is very important honor the vows you've taken to one another in the presence of god in your marriage honor your parents if jesus christ didn't have a problem and could honor his parents until his ministry began i guess we all can learn from that being led by the holy spirit is not fighting against everybody because god is leading me no if god is leading you his presence is building the fruit of the spirit inside you hallelujah amen <laughs> obedience is very different from <laughs> honor honor is an attitude obedience is just the action part of it many people obey wash the plate so you're washing plate but in your heart 22 year old what is thinking wish i could throw this plate on her <laughs> that is attitude action is obedience but god is watching your attitude action is hallelujah but god is watching the attitude who knows when he'll stop god is watching your attitude <laughs> God is watching her at my god you can't fool my god because his eyes can see the heart of the human his presence builds attitudes hallelujah hallelujah amen i'm preaching so nice i want to hear this message myself Honoring God is important. Honor the Holy Spirit as a person in your life. Honor his presence. Why did Satan get kicked out from heaven? Why did Satan get kicked out from heaven? Why did Lucifer get kicked out from heaven? Was he watching pornography? Did he commit adultery with other angels? Was he a drug addict? Every evening fully drunk? <laughs> What was Satan's mistake? he did not honor the presence of god pride stopped him from honoring hey on your scale of sin you may think pride and dishonoring god is at the bottom but on his scale of holiness honoring him is on the top which is very important oh my goodness pentecostal churches need to learn holiness is not just the absence of drinking and absence of adultery and absence of all those things Holiness is the presence of honoring God honoring the holy spirit in your life I am preaching good I shouldn't be so excited I should look more normal but this is beautiful There are four voices that you will hear when the holy spirit is with you One is God's voice the other is the loud voice of the devil the other is people's voices and the last is your own voice four voices come in every human mind god speaks very softly devil very loud constantly traumatizing your mind he the bible says he's like a roaring lion like a roaring lion adjective adjective characterization like a he's not a roaring lion like a roaring lion <laughs> actually he's a mouse with a megaphone that's all he is <laughs> he is actually a squeaky mice with a loud microphone that's all you shut him off and he is over somebody is getting irritated change the party when i talk about the devil some people get very irritated you need to come to the right party <laughs> if you be a part of the jesus party then you won't get upset when i preach against the devil <laughs> 
The other is people's voices. Now that's something you'll have to choose how to hear it and how to filter it out. And then your own voice. And to distinguish God's voice from this demonic voice, from your own voice, requires fellowship with the Holy Spirit. When you talk about people's voices, please remember one thing. Now, this is something I struggled with. You know, as a pastor, I try to please everybody. And, and this happens to all of us. And, and the Lord taught me, God has not given us the Holy Spirit to please everybody. God has not given us the Holy Spirit to make everyone happy. Do that as much as you can. It's a good thing. But Holy Spirit was not given to make everyone happy and please everyone. Holy Spirit was given to love everyone. The problem is we make people happy though we don't love them. God wants us to love people. It's a fruit of the spirit. When you love people, you start looking at them through the eyes of God. It's a big difference. Big difference. And you start working towards serving them with God's plan for their life, whether they are happy or no. If you don't walk close to the Holy Spirit, you will live in the fear of evil or the fear of what people can do to you or the fear of circumstances. Never let circumstances become bigger than the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the example I'm going to pull out while I close is from Acts chapter 2. Wind came from heaven. Sound of a mighty rushing wind. Fire came from heaven. Thousands, ten thousands of people in Jerusalem gathered to see this phenomenon of fire. That came upon people. And what did Apostle Peter preach in Acts chapter 2? How to get this sound in your house. How to get this fire in your pocket. How to get this tongues as a generational gift. Not one fire party. Not one, oh tomorrow we are going to have a sound fasting prayer. No, only one message. Through Jesus have relationship with the Holy Spirit. No matter what circumstance you go through, whether it's the fire of the Holy Spirit, the wind from heaven, or people that are standing against you, stick to the fundamental message of the cross. It is friendship with the Holy Spirit. It is relationship with God. It is coming to God through faith. And when you have that deep relationship, no weapon formed against you will ever prosper. And what you saw happening in David's life will happen in your life. You don't need missiles and cannonballs to bring down the giants against you. That little stone is enough in your hand, brother, when God is on your side. I want to close. I get excited, but when you find wind and fire in your life, don't look for a platform to shine. Look for an opportunity to serve. Your passion for God must be married to persistence. Only then consistency can happen. Consistency is the baby when passion and persistence get married. When fire and anointing of the Holy Spirit come and you want to do something, ask yourself four questions. Does it honor Jesus Christ, my Lord? Does it produce greater righteousness in my life? Do I respect people that God has put in my life? Does it make me more scriptural in my dealings with them? Am I able to serve as God wants me to serve? If you study human sociology today in Christianity, more than Protestants, more than Catholics, it is the anointed people which is the largest group in the Christian world today. Catholics are not the biggest group. Protestants are not the biggest group. People filled with the Holy Spirit in both the compartments together are the biggest group in Christian faith. Why? Because the Holy Spirit revival is mighty and powerful happening all over the world. The Bible says in the book of Revelation and the Spirit says come and the church called the bride says come. All who hear say come, drink of this. For abundance. Close your eyes and say, Father, I want that abundance of relationship with you. I don't want to struggle with myself. I want to surrender to you. I just don't want to get directions from you. I want to get my strength from you. I want to draw my character from you. I want to draw my purpose from you. I don't want to treat you. I don't want to treat you 
like the local horoscope. I don't want to treat you like the local soothsayer. I don't want to know you as the local Pentecostal prophet. No, 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 no. I don't want to come to you just for directions. I want to come to you for relationship. I don't want to come to you just for provisions. I want to come to you for a deeper relationship. Lord, through these Sundays, let me develop that intimate relationship with your presence. Hallelujah. To be mindful that you have a great plan for me. I don't want a friendship. I don't want a relationship that is greater than my relationship with you. On a human level, I thank you for all the friendships. But on a personal level, let your Holy Spirit work in my life. Let your grace work in my life. Let your anointing work in my life. Let your person bring your presence in a powerful way. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the authority you have given with the anointing. Thank you, you have given us the power to shut out every voice of the enemy. Hallelujah. Thank you that we have nothing to fear for you are with us, O God. Help us to cultivate that culture for you will make us. You are faithful to make us. Help us to have that listening spirit to be guided by you, to honor, to respect your Lordship in our lives. Like Jesus, our master, give us that grace to respect spiritual authority, things that you've put in our life, that we treat them with respect. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand together? We'll sing a song and we'll pray and close. <coughs> What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything. Oh!
came alive today. We just want to thank you that you are making better versions of ourselves by your Holy Spirit. We just want to thank you for the strength, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your constant whispers, your voice that is speaking into each one of our life, that we will, oh God, be transformed by your presence that you, your touch will continue to, O oh God, abide upon each one of our life. Your presence will never leave us nor forsake us. We just want to thank you, Lord. Lord, at this time, we pray especially for those who are celebrating their birthdays and marriage anniversaries. We thank you, Lord, for adding it another year into their life. Bless them abundantly. Father, we pray for those who are traveling this week. Your journey mercies will go with them. Lord, we pray for those who have come to the church for the very first time. Their life will never be the same again. Father, we pray for the tithes and the offering that you will bless your children, that you be the Jehovah Jireh, and you shall supply all their needs according to the riches and glory. Lord, we pray that, that you will lead us, O God, in victory. Lead us, O God, in your favor. We thank you, Master. To you alone be all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Now may the grace of Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon each one of us from now and forevermore. And the people of God say, Amen. 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 We want to take this time to welcome all those who are here for the very first time. Church, why don't we welcome them? Come on. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning. As you go out, please do walk into the guest lounge. There is a team waiting to meet with you and talk to you. All those who require prayer, the pastors are here in the front as well as in the overflow. Have a blessed week ahead. God bless you. Bye-bye.